January 17th, 1994. Can you hear me okay back there? We on? <laughs> on January 17th, 1994, the largest earthquake that had hit this area in many years came at 4.31 a.m. in the San Fernando, San Fernando Valley in California. 56 people lost their lives that day. 16 of them died in the North Ridge Meadows apartment complex. Now, North Ridge Meadows was known as a soft story structure. You engineers in here know what that is, but for those of us who are not engineers, I had to look it up. A soft story structure is an apartment complex that is supported by columns, typically three to five inches in diameter, which doesn't sound like a lot, but there are several of these. And they provide space underneath this complex for parking and meeting spaces and uh, maybe even retail spaces. Well, 16 people died in the North Ridge Meadows complex because these three to five inch pillars were not meant to withstand the back and forth movement of an earthquake. If you're going to to make a building like this structurally sound, you have to retrofit them with at least 10 inch columns. Now, to me, still a 10 inch column doesn't sound like a lot to hold thousands and thousands of tons of weight. And yet that's what they needed to do. Well, 25 years later, just 10 days ago, on July 4th, another earthquake hit this area. This time it measured 6.4 uh, on the Richter scale, or 6.7, excuse me, on the Richter scale. And um, the next day, the, the 5th of July, another earthquake hit, this time measuring 7.1 in magnitude. Now, you would think that they would be prepared for this, but there was a man who kind of sounded the alarm, and, and some looked at him sort of as an alarmist, but he's not an alarmist. His name is Kenneth O'Dell, and his title would tell you this guy should know what he's talking about. His title is President of the Structural Engineers Association of Southern California. They have been sounding the alarm for quite some time, 25 years, that is. But to this date, only 14% of soft story structures have retrofitted their columns so that they would withstand an earthquake. 14%. Those of you who are really good with math, the estimate is that 500 million people call soft story structures home. How many people are at risk? I hope that these latest tremblers, they're calling them now instead of earthquakes, must be a more politically correct term. Um, I hope that these recent ones have really woken them up to this, this dangerous situation that they find themselves in. Now, as disciples of Jesus, living in the Western world, life is pretty safe, enjoyable, even prosperous. A matter of fact, if you look around the world, even our homeless people are more wealthy than most people, 85 to 90 percent of the rest of the population in the world. However, there are times when we get hit with earthquakes. Sometimes they're minor and sometimes they're massive. And the question I think we have to ask is, are the columns of our lives, the columns that our lives are built upon, are they strong enough to withstand those earthquakes. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, has been talking about, in chapter 4, where we just were last week, he's been talking about what it means to build a life that's strong. A life based on what Jesus has done, who Jesus is, and, and how we as a church can become strong so that we as a community and we as individuals can withstand whatever the earthquakes that this world show, throw, throws at us are. And in Ephesians chapter 5, God continues 
to strengthen our support columns, strengthening us to withstand any storm, any problem, any earthquake that comes our way because he wants us to learn to grow in, in how we love, in how we live, and in who most influences us. Think for just a moment. How would you define love? And what would you say is the outcome of the life you're looking for? And as you look at those two things, who most influences you towards those? Well, that's what Paul is going to draw our attention to this morning. Turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll look at the first 20 verses today. If you are following along in the the, the Bible in front of you in the Pew Bible. We're going to be looking at page 816. If you don't happen to own a Bible and you'd like to have one, we'd love for you to take this as our gift. So, God's definition of love, we'll discover here shortly, is not found in the dictionary. It's revealed in a person. We see love lived out by Jesus. Look at these first two verses. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Therefore, be imitators of God. Look what God did, God in the flesh, Jesus. Look what he did and imitate that. That's the standard we we look for. And then he says, as the, the NIV translates it, as dearly loved children. He wants to drive home the point that Jesus did what he did because he loves you. And so, as we imitate him, we are to do what we do because we love him and we love one another. The kind of love that we see in Jesus is a self-sacrificing love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that says, I will do what is best for you even when it costs me. It's a commitment that says, I am in this for you, come hell or high water. I'm in this for you no matter what happens because my love is like Jesus' love. It's a self-sacrificing love. And so Jesus himself defined love for us simply this way in John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, than a man or a woman lay down their lives for a friend. That's the kind of love that he has for us. Now, in stark contrast to God's deep and eternal definition of love stands the world's short-term, shallow definition of love. Now, this passage the next, the next couple of verses describe for us what the world's definition of love is. It doesn't come right out and say, hey, this is how God defines love, this is how the world defines love, but you see the contrast very clearly. A self-sacrificing love with something a bit different. And as he describes it, he uses three terms. He describes it as, um, excuse me, verse three, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness. Now, Sexual immorality is, is a, a, a kind of a, a bucket word. It's pornea. It's where we get our word pornography from. But it's a word that describes any kind of out of bounds, out of God's standard sort of sexual activity. Whether it's sex before marriage, sex with someone that isn't your partner after marriage, any sort of sexual um, out of bounds behavior, this is what God is saying this is not the kind of love you want. This is not the kind of love that honors me. And then he adds the word impurity to it. Now the word impurity, just kind of, another way to, to translate the word is disgusting. He's drawing out for us this contrast of, of the kind of love that the world tends to have, the kind of love that we maybe have experienced ourselves, the kind of love that we maybe are even being tempted with from time to time, even today. And saying, that's the kind of love that does not honor God. That's the kind of love that God has no desire for us to be about. 
In his April 8th Breakpoint commentary, John Stone Street quoted C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, The most dangerous ideas in a society are not the ones being argued, but rather the ones that are assumed. The ones that are assumed. And then Stone Street goes on and says, In our time, that saying, what he just quoted from C.S. Lewis, perfectly describes the idea that our desires determine our identities. How I feel determines who I am. Our culture has fully trained people when they talk of sexual desires to not say I feel, but rather to reach for being verbs like I am. If I experience or I feel same-sex attraction, I therefore am gay or homosexual. We have made a dangerous transition from this is how I am to this is who I am. We've been conditioned to think that because we feel a certain way, those feelings define us. The Bible tells us, though, we don't need to discover our identity. Our identities are not fungible. They're not flexible. They're not changing, and we don't determine it. Our identity is given to us by God. Our definition of morality should not be drawn from the shallow, man-centered, ever-shifting culture. The standard of morality for the disciple of Jesus comes from God's objective, unchanging word. Not because God is a prude or God is out of touch, but because God is the one who made us, God is the one who knows us best and loves us most and knows the design that he has for us. Now, clearly, this is a very touchy subject right now in our culture and society because this definition um, is not one that is very popular right now. And I want to say that we don't say this because we hate anybody. We don't say this because we, we don't want to be welcoming and loving to anyone who would come in our doors. Every single person that entered the door this morning is a sinner. Myself included. Like Paul would say, I am the chief of sinners, right? I mean, we all know our own hearts. This is not us standing up and saying, we're good, you're bad. When somebody, you hear this terminology sometimes, when somebody is, uh, becomes a new believer and, and they, we might say, are delivered from homosexuality, that's really a misnomer. Really, they, like me and like everybody else, who may not struggle with that particular sin, when we come to Jesus, we are delivered from sin. We are all in the same boat. We either have been forgiven and we are children of God or we have not been forgiven and we need to come to that place where we understand our sinfulness. We confess it before God. We repent of it or turn from it and we invite him to forgive us and make us new people. That's the kind of mindset that he wants from us. Then he kind of summarizes all of it with the word covetous. The easier word is greed. And the idea of this sort of worldly sort of love is a love that wants more and more and is never satisfied. It is an unquenchable self-indulgence. So we have self-sacrificing love and we have a self-indulgent sort of love and when it comes to that self-indulgent sort of love Paul continues on and he says that kind of love must not even be named among you it's improper for God's holy people 
we don't love because we want you to give me something in return. We love because we love God and by showing the sacrificial love that he's given to us, we mimic him, we imitate him and the world stands up and takes notice. Someone once said, you can gauge a person's character by what, by what makes them laugh and what makes them cry. See, Paul's going to continue on and he's going to, he's going to really kind of put his finger on some things that, that many of us probably still struggle with. Our conversation, our joking, our innuendo, they will out us. Let's be real. We lust because we don't appreciate what we have. At the base of it, we don't think that God knows best for us. And so uh, instead of appreciating the car we drive, the body we have, the spouse we have, the resources that have been entrusted to us, we look across the fence and the, the grass is greener because we are not trusting God and not saying, God, I thank you for what you've given to me. The solution is to be thankful for what God has given us. Let there be no filthiness, verse 4 says, no foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. Instead, what's he say instead? Let there be thanksgiving. Let us say, God, thank you for the breath in my lungs. Thank you for the sight in my eyes. Thank you for the hearing in my ears. Thank you for the energy to be able to walk and to do, to run, to enjoy. And as those things diminish as we age, thank you, God, for what you've given me and for what I have now. An attitude of thankfulness will change every single thing about us. Now, maybe you're thinking, come on, Len telling a little bit of an off-color joke, some risque humor, that's not that big a deal. Why are you getting so wound up about it? Well, that's one of the beauties of preaching through a book. I didn't look at our congregation and say, oh man, they're, they're doing this stuff. I didn't look at myself and say, oh, I gotta do a self-revelatory kind of message here. We're just preaching through the book. And this is what Paul is saying. Remember, remember what this book is all about? How can you and I play our part in God's plan to transform this world? We believe God has called First Baptist Church to be a force for good in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Hopefully, you're hearing that enough to where you're like, I can say that with you. We believe God has called us to be a force for good. Say, a force for good. In golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Now, the church around the globe has taken several hits. Why? Because in some places, under some leaders, the church has not been a force for good. It's been a force for themselves. Or it's been a force for greed. Or it's been a force for you fill in the blank. And as it is that in that local community, the world hears about it. And why are they that way? Because they're not being disciples of Jesus. So we're about being disciples. We believe that a disciple is someone who connects with God personally, truly, really. Someone who loves Jesus with everything they have. Someone who grows in their spiritual maturity and then someone who has been prepared by God then to engage in our culture. Engage with the people we work with. Engage with the people we live near. Engage with the people that we play with in our sports teams and whatever activities we have. That's what God's called us to do. That's who God's called us to be. We are part of His world-changing movement called the church. 
And it's our prayer that First Baptist Church would take very seriously God's call in our lives collectively as a community. That's why in a couple of weeks, we won't have worship here. On the 28th, we're going to go down to to Parfit Park and we're going to worship with all the other together churches of Golden because we want this Golden community to know that we as a collection of nine evangelical churches in this community we love Jesus and we love each other and we can get along and we want to worship him together so please invite a friend join us down there Make plans for the rest of the day to walk around the booths and walk around, look at the antique cars, hang out with folks, and maybe even begin opening up a dialogue for spiritual things. Maybe they'll say, well, wait a minute, you guys didn't have church today? Yeah, we had church. We're down there together because we're part of something bigger than just us. We are part of the Together Church of Golden because we all collectively, corporately love God and we as a local body want to be a force for good in Golden, that means cooperating with other churches in Golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. So he says, God takes this thing very seriously. He says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now let me be careful here. Who does the wrath of God come upon? What's the passage say? Sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience. Now we talked about this earlier in chapter 2, but just a quick refresher. A son of disobedience or a daughter of disobedience is someone whose life is characterized by disobedience to God. Someone who lives in utter, total rebellion against God. They want nothing whatsoever to do with God. So he's not saying here that if you as a disciple of Jesus looked at something on the computer last night that you are feeling guilty about right now, he's not saying you're no longer a son, you're no longer a daughter. When you feel that, it's the Spirit of God convicting you, telling you you are a son or a daughter, and reminding you, hey, that's not how we behave. That's not what God's son or daughter does. Get back in line here. You don't lose your salvation when you sin. The Spirit of God comes and reminds you, that's not who, that's not who you are anymore. But he is saying that that lifestyle should not be the example you said. It should not be what other people see in you. Because that is a self-indulgent sort of love. And what's the kind of love we're supposed to display? Imitating God. Imitating what Jesus did. Self-sacrificing love. And if we allow God's Spirit to work inside of us, He will transform us so that the world will see that there's a difference in us. Don't settle for self-indulgent faux love. Love self-sacrificially. So here's the thing. As a disciple of Jesus... You are an object of God's love as dearly loved children, verse 1 says. You are not an object of His wrath. You are no longer a daughter or son of disobedience. Stop, Paul is saying, stop allowing your behavior to mirror the behavior of those who do not know God. Stop letting your behavior mirror your behavior before you came to know Christ. So he says then in verse 7, Therefore, do not become partners with them. Don't link arms with people who are like this. And again, we're not doing it to say, I'm better and you're bad. We're doing it to say, I love Jesus. And I want you to know that. Because I want you to love Jesus. And I want my life to stand for something. 
before Christ came into your life, you were not just in darkness. Catch this. This is pretty powerful stuff. You were not just walking around in darkness, which is kind of the image we have. Because the world is dark and Jesus comes into the world and he brings light into the world, right? You weren't just walking around in darkness. Listen to what this verse says. This verse, first part of verse 8. At one time, you were darkness. You were darkness. So was I. And then Jesus transformed you. He didn't simply change your residence. You know, one passage says that he translated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, right? He didn't just simply change your residence. He changed you at the very core of who you are. But now, the verse continues, you are light in the Lord. So, walk as children of light. Instead of sexual immorality being your behavior and your conversation, someone who is light shines that light in how they speak and in how they behave. For the fruit of the light, the verse continues, is found in all that is good and right and true. It's found in how we live and how we behave. Those good and right and true things that typify us. Now last week, The last few verses of chapter 4, verse 25 to 32, he gave us five specific things that if we would allow the Spirit of God through the Word of God to transform us, it would change everything about us. And I challenged you last week to not do all five of these, just pick one. I had somebody tell me this morning that God, God prompted them to speak the truth to someone this week, last week. And they spoke the truth to that person and they were just praying about it, wondering what happened. And they got a letter. And the letter was that person's response to them speaking the truth in love. Just a refresher. Paul told us in those, those few verses, tell the truth, keep short accounts, give to those in need, Build up with your words rather than tear down with them and forgive like Jesus. When we do that, we please God and He transforms us to be more and more like Christ. Another, word, another way of saying it is when we wake up from our spiritual stupor, we realize our need for Jesus and we put our faith in Him. He makes us light and sends us out into this dark world using our behavior and our conversation to shine light not to show that we think we're better than anybody else but to reflect the love that we have with Jesus so so then we have this really interesting sounding verse anything that becomes visible is light now think about that anything that becomes visible is light what in the world is he saying there I will tell you that I scratched my head over this one for quite a while. Here's what I think he's saying. Anything that becomes visible becomes visible because the light shined on it. So what's he saying? He's saying that when you walk into a dark place, and remember, you are now light, and anyone who doesn't know Jesus is dark. So when you, with your behavior and your words, come into connection with someone else who is not a follower of Jesus the light that is in you will draw out the darkness in them that's why if somebody's telling an off color joke we shouldn't join in because what are we doing we're taking our light and we're hiding it what we do instead is we reflect Jesus character in a time like that and our light Shines, the dark, shines, shines on that darkness and makes it visible for what it really is. So then he says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. When that light is shining on that other person, what's it saying to them? There is a light in me that is not in you. Wake up. Wake up. Because the light that you see in me is the light that Jesus wants to have in you. See, the thing is, we don't have to say a thing. 
We don't have to make anybody feel guilty. We don't have to do anything like that. We just need to live like a follower of Jesus. We just need to make sure that our behavior and our conversation reflects Jesus and God's love. And we don't do it in judgment. Remember, we're imitating God. And what did God do? He sacrificed himself. He showed his love by giving everything of himself. So it's our self-sacrificing love that shines through in all of this. Love sacrificially and light wherever you go. But how are we supposed to pull those two impossible things off? Do you have anyone in your life that's hard to love? I'm not raising my hand because I think I'm that person for you. <laughs> yeah, we all have people like that. This passage is not saying, okay, do this. We're getting to the punchline here. This passage is telling us what, what should be happening in our lives. We're going to learn here in just a second, or be reminded in just a second, that we cannot, we cannot do this on our own. Verse 15 says, Look carefully then how you walk or live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What's he saying here? You and I have a huge role to play. When we love like God loves, we light the world. You and I have only this one life. There are no second chances. It's appointed unto men and women once to die, and after this, judgment. Those are hard and harsh words that we don't like to speak in this culture and society. But heaven is real and hell is real. An eternal separation awaits anyone who has not come to Christ for forgiveness of their sins. If we have not come to him on whom God's wrath has fallen for our forgiveness, God's wrath will fall on us. But that's why Jesus died, so it didn't have to. We only have one life. There's an old saying, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We need to make sure that we are allowing God to work in us, living as the light we are, so that we can light this dark world. But we cannot do this in our own strength. We need help. So we come to verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now wine and alcohol are not condemned in the Scriptures. It is okay to drink alcohol. We always kind of get that rap here, especially with the Baptist name, right? But being under the influence, being drunk, is not anything that God wants us to be about. Because there's only one that should be influencing us. See, that's the, that's the interesting part of this com comparison. Don't get drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence of wine. Don't behave in a way that's outside of who you normally are because of wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Behave outside of who you normally would because you are under the influence of the Spirit. That's what he wants to, us to understand. Now this word debauchery kind of brings us back to what he began saying at the beginning. Debauchery is the excessive, self-serving, self-indulgent abuse of anything. In this case, alcohol, he's saying. But anything can become an idol in your life. Anything can become God in your life. That's what debauchery is all about. And he's saying... God's light is in this world because you're in this world because Jesus came and gave that light to you and if you and I choose to imbibe in what this world has to offer that shows that the love we are living is a self-indulgent self-serving love not a self-sacrificing love that should typify a disciple of Jesus. He says, be filled. Be filled. It's a command. But I'll apologize right now for the Greek lesson. I'm going to give you just a brief one. 
It's also in the passive voice, which means that the filling that I'm commanded to do is something I can't do. It is done, something that is done to me, something that is done for me. Be filled with the Spirit. Well, how am I supposed to do that? Remember? The Holy Spirit's supposed to be the one influencing me. What's he saying to me? He's saying, you are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, and the way you do that is you yield. You surrender. You submit to the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you allow him to change you. When you, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are baptized into the body of Christ. That happens one time, 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen says. But as a follower of Jesus, you are continually filled, surrendered, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, to draw out the, the, the clear understanding of what this verse, simple little verse means, you, you should really translate it this way, be being continually filled. Be being continually filled. That's what he's saying. We continue every single day of our lives to surrender ourselves to the Spirit so that he can work inside every one of us. Now, this book of Ephesians, I, I've told several of you uh, personally, just one-on-one, I've understood things in this book that I've never seen before. It's come alive to me. And I think it's, it's, a, it's on purpose from God's perspective because I think God wants to do something at First Baptist Church of Golden. I believe that God has, has for such a time as this, caused us to decide to do this study because he wants to continue to transform and change us. 155 years we've been around and God has not done with us yet. But I don't think anything will change. I don't think it will be anything but business as usual if we as a congregation don't buy into the idea that we have been called by God to be a force for good and golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. And the book of Ephesians is that catalytic reminder you have a role to play in the transformation of this church you have a role to play in the transformation of this church into a force for good and golden and if we don't play that role God will bring someone else who will don't miss out on what he's got going on. I'm excited to see what God has in mind for us. Now, as we've been going through the book of Ephesians, we have grown in our understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and the way he wants to influence us. It's been growing and building throughout the book of Ephesians, so I want to just bullet through several of these things. There's like 15 things that I've noticed, and I didn't even try to do an in-depth kind of thing. I just... Here are some things that I've noticed that the Holy Spirit, that I've learned about the Holy Spirit. He's the conduit of God's every blessing. The Holy Spirit is the conduit of God's every blessing. Second, he sealed us securely into God's family. He raised Jesus from the dead and that same power, the power of the Spirit, lives inside of every single one of us to enable us to walk with God. He unites us with Christ and unifies us in Christ. He is the disciples' inner power source. He revealed God's mystery of Jew and Gentile becoming one new person. His work exceeds anything we could ever imagine. He initiates, maintains, and grows unity in the church. He gives every disciple a gift so that we may each participate in Jesus' kingdom expansion. He oversees the growing unity of Jesus' church. He illuminates God's word to, our, to renew our minds. He seals us securely against the day of, of, of judgment and redemption. He is grieved when we work against his efforts to bring, maintain, and grow unity. And he, verse 18 tells us, is the disciples' internal influence empowering God's word to transform us into the image of Jesus. We cannot love the way God wants us to. We cannot dispel the darkness that still remains in us on our own. We must have the Holy Spirit. And then he says, 
This is how you'll know when the Holy Spirit is working in your midst. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. A hint as to how the Spirit makes this happen. Because he doesn't really say super clearly in here. How does he make this happen? Is found in a parallel passage in the book of Colossians. Colossians 3.16 says this. Some of it will sound familiar. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And listen to this. See if it sounds familiar. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. See the parallel there? The influence of the Holy Spirit is, is shown through the Word of God dwelling richly inside every one of us. We come more powerfully under the Spirit's influence, or as verse 23 of chapter 4, uh, 4 said, He renews our minds as we are in the Word of God. And we are asking Him to help us understand what He's saying. Time in the Word. Inviting the Spirit of God to reform my mind into the image of Jesus, that is what will transform me. That is what will change me. Remember in verse 13 of chapter 4, we all have a responsibility, it says, until we all attain to the unity of faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, I think Oswald Chambers had it right when he said, it really is true to say, I cannot live a holy life. But you can decide to let Christ make you holy. You cannot serve the Lord, but you can place yourself in the proper position where God's almighty power will flow through you. <clears throat> Submitted to the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus drew a super powerful picture of this for us. Back in a passage that's probably pretty familiar to you. Matthew chapter 7, he says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand and the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Are we building a short story structure with columns too small to handle the weight? Or are we allowing the Spirit of God to retrofit those columns, prepare us for whatever storms come our way? because we're leaning and relying on him. I think God wants us to build a faith that will withstand any and every storm that's thrown at us. I think he wants us to be influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit through God's word, and then he wants us to know that we will then light the world with our sacrificial love. So, whatever your political leanings are, I'm, I'm not about to make a political statement, but I am going to use a phrase that might raise some hackles. Make America great again. Some of you have the hats. Some of you have the t-shirts. Some of you hate the hats and hate the t-shirts. But I think there's something to that phrase. Because I don't think God wants us to make America great again. I think he wants us to make America grateful again. Now, the Spirit of God kind of snuck in this concept as we've been looking at this chapter. Back in verse 4, it says, Instead, let there be thanksgiving. Then verse 20 giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the parallel passage, Colossians 3.16, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. What is he saying? You know what's going to be the greatest testimony to a watching world that there's light in you? 
Always giving thanks to God. Always being grateful. If we want to make America grateful again, if we want to make First Baptist Church grateful again, maybe it could start with us. Maybe, maybe we could summarize everything that Paul is saying to us here and take this one and not just put it in our pockets as we walk up, but inscribe it in our minds. I would challenge every one of us this week to choose to be grateful. Choose to be grateful. Len, you don't know how bad I feel. My body is falling apart. Choose to be grateful that there's breath in your lungs. Yeah, but Len, the breath in my lungs has been depleted by 50%. Choose to be grateful for the gifts God has given you. Instead of walking around with our glasses half empty, choose to be grateful. And God's Spirit will continue to grow you and to make you as you yield to Him through His Word. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are a God that is great. And we are grateful. Thank you for the love you showed us, the self-sacrificing love. Thank you for the challenge to, to imitate you. But God, thank you for the reminder that we can't do it. So we yield ourselves even now as we consider what this week will, will bring our way, we yield ourselves to you and we invite you to take us. In the words of the song we sang, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Not just in this room, but in me. Flood this place. Make the atmosphere one of gratefulness. In Jesus' name.